My name is Adam Krimble, and I'm going to be talking about the crowdsource arcade. Um, just a little bit of background so we're clear where I'm coming from. I'm coming from this from the background of a historian, so I'm not a video game maker. I didn't make any video games until I started this project a few uh, months ago. So as a historian, the collection that I was working with here is the British Library's Flickr collection. And if you're not familiar with this, what it is was um, there's a, just over a million images that have been digitized by the library and put up online uh, on Flickr. And uh, they have been put up under a Creative Commons Zero license. This means you can do whatever you want with them. And the origin of these images is from uh, a series of books that were digitized and the software that was involved in that digitization process uh, was designed so that it could recognize when it had come across an image. So it sucked that image out of the books and it stored them as an image file. Uh, and it's also stored those images along with all sorts of metadata that you would expect uh, an institution like the British Library to have about the uh, objects in its collection. So we know, for example, that we know which book these came from. We know which page they came from. We know who the author of the book was. Uh, we know when it was published. But we don't actually know a whole lot more about most of, about the content of most of these images. We don't know what they're images of. And I think that makes it a great target for a crowdsourcing uh, or citizen science type activity. Because in order to curate these images and to tag these images with meaningful information, we can ask people to do simple repetitive tasks. Uh, and this is the type of thing that is often done with uh, a crowdsourcing activity. And I should say we do know a little bit about what's in these because since these were put up online a couple of years ago, some people have done a little bit of tagging and a little bit of curating. So we've got subsets of, inf of images where, for example, we know these ones have bicycles in them, these ones are a map, uh, these ones are portraits. But the vast majority of them we don't actually have meaningful tags for. So that is the image side of things. This is the data set that um, we're concerned with. And I want to shift now to the video game side of things, because this is the inspiration for what I was working on. And when I first arrived in the UK back in 2010 and I started taking trains for the first time in my life, what I noticed was what people were doing on the trains was, for the most part, reading books, reading newspapers, and reading Kindles. And in the past couple of years, that has changed. And when you go home tonight on the train, as many of you, as many of you will, um, have a look for people doing this. You, you now see people playing video games on their phones and on their tablets out in public. Uh, and this is huge numbers of people are doing this now. This, the, the number of people tonight that are going to play what we call a casual video game, a game that you can just spend a couple of minutes with, the amount of energy that goes into that is just astronomical. And my idea really was to see if we can capture some of that energy uh, and put it towards the cultural heritage industry and see if we can get people playing with the cultural heritage uh, content that's in this collection. So casual video games, as I said, the ones you can just jump into for a couple of minutes. Um, things like Candy Crush, for example, you might be familiar with, or Angry Birds. These aren't involved games where you have to spend weeks and weeks to learn how to play them. And this is a tweet that came up online, I think over the summer. It's been retweeted quite a lot. If you laughed at this, and I assume you played video games as a child. So years of gaming have taught me there is something behind this wall. And the point of putting this up is because uh, for people like me who spent most of the youth um, playing Nintendo and things like Nintendo, uh, we've learned to look at the world and the rhetoric of video games in a particular way. So in this case, we've got visual evidence that something in the environment is different than everything else. And in video games, when you see that, that means you should, you should pay attention. Something's interesting here. There's treasure behind that, or there's a secret passage. And there's some way that you can get in there, probably uh, with a skill or a tool that you can find nearby. And we can extend this because there are so many things that we've learned about video games, those of us who've grown up playing them, uh, that are just inherent. So we've got rewards, and on the top I've got some examples of rewards from Mario games. Coins are always good when it comes to video games. If you see a coin, you go get it. And on the bottom we've got risks. And we are conditioned to avoid those risks when we're playing video games. And the reason I put this up, because it gets you, I think, I hope it gets you to think what is a video game. And what I would suggest is a video game is a virtual universe 
in which there are a series of rules created by the person who's making that game. And our job is to follow those rules to win the game, to save the princess or whatever it happens to be. Uh, but there's also a genre here, and these things are part of the genre of video games. So lava is always bad in video games. Coins are always good. And if we can tap into that language when we're thinking about making crowdsourcing video games, I think we can pull on this idea of fun as well. Now, what makes a video game fun? Uh, this is controversial, actually. There are people that would disagree with this statement, but this is something I never had to wrestle with until I started thinking about this project and how we were going to make fun crowdsourcing games. And a man named Sid Meier, who's a famous video game maker, um, suggested a few years ago that a game is a series of interesting choices. And this is why Candyland is a really crappy, boring game. For those of you who had the misfortune of ever playing Candyland. This is a board game that's designed for four-year-olds, and the problem with it is as soon as you start playing, you cease to make any meaningful decisions. So all you do is you roll the dice and you move your little person around the board. And four-year-olds love this because it gives them an equal opportunity to win the game. And anybody who's over the age of four thinks it's absolute crap because <laughs> nothing you do will affect the outcome. <laughs> So this is, some, I think, something that's worth keeping in mind when we're thinking about building a game. There needs to be an interesting decision, and that decision has to affect the, the course of the game. If you don't feel like you're affecting the outcome, then you're not really playing. So in this case, we've got an example here where I'm asked to decide if I'm going to sacrifice this person, uh, and presumably that will have an impact on the rest of my experience. But I also think we need to make sure that we have the option of losing. Um, because if you can't lose, then again, there's, there's no threat. It's all carrot. There's no stick to this. And uh, in some of the attempts to gamify crowdsourcing experiences that I've seen, I think people have been hesitant to incorporate this idea of game over or of losing because they think if they, um, if they allow their player to lose, they'll get frustrated and they'll leave. They'll stop playing. But I think actually in some cases that could be counterproductive. And if you can't lose, then you don't get that feeling of urgency, um, and you don't, in fact, keep playing. So just to recap those ideas then, in terms of making a game fun, I'll just draw on these ideas of interesting decisions, and those interesting decisions have to affect the success in the game. And it all ha also has to be possible to lose. And when you do lose, it has to be your fault. You do not want random deaths that don't make any sense, for example. It has to be because you fell into the lava. <laughs> and in terms of a crowdsourcing or cultural heritage perspective, our goal with this is to make something that's fun, but also that generates accurate metadata about the collection. And this is what I call the crowdsourcing conundrum, because if you think about a game, for example, Super Mario, you fall in the lava, you die every single time that happens. But when we're talking about getting images tagged and we don't know what's in the image, we don't actually know if you've done it properly. So as far as we're concerned, you either fell in the lava or you saved the princess. And we're not quite sure which one that is. And it makes it very difficult then for your decisions that you make to have realistic consequences. And, and have that virtual universe that has a clearly defined set of rules that allows us to feel like our decisions matter. So the solutions, I think, um, that we've come up with through this project is to make sure that you're controlling what you can. Um, so when you know somebody's done something wrong, you punish them. If you're not quite sure, try not to make too much of a big deal and hope they don't notice. And this is, this is what we, I think, have discovered through the process. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of uh, how that works in practice. And what we wanted to do, actually, was to draw on the power of the crowd for solving this conundrum. So what we did is we hosted what's known as a game jam. Um, and a game jam, um, if you're not familiar, is fairly common in the amateur game making community. This is something that happens all the time. It's kind of like a hackathon, if you're familiar with a hackathon. So we have a problem, we post it on a web forum, and we challenge people over usually a period of time, a week for example, to build a video game that tackles that specific challenge. So we posted our crowdsourcing conundrum, we told them about the image collection that we had, 
And to get them going, actually, we gave them a subset of, the, of 600 of these images rather than the full million, which was a bit much. But we gave them 600 of these images along with all the metadata that we had for those images. We also gave them subsets of, I mentioned some of them had been tagged as bicycles or tagged as portraits. So we gave them some of those where we knew what, would, what was in the image. And these are the control sets that they can use. And we made sure that some of them were images that we actually had no idea what was in uh, the pictures. So that's the information that they were given. And we posted this online in September and had ourselves a game jam. And we ended up with um, four games. Two of them I created, actually. Uh, the, the less good ones are the ones that I created. I'll show you those in just a second. Uh, and we had two people, one from Spain and one from Germany, um, take up this challenge and try to engage actively with uh, the problem. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some videos of, of this gameplay, and I'm going to show you how we're using gameplay to collect data about these uh, images. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the tricks that we can use to decide whether or not the metadata we're getting is any good. So the first one is one that I didn't actually end up pursuing. So this is quite rough, and you'll have to keep that in mind uh, when I show you. This is called a platformer. So this is like Super Mario. You run along platforms, and you've got this view from the side. Um, sometimes this is also called a... Um, a side-scroller game. So basically, I will just show you the, the <coughs> gameplay here. You're a little guy. You're running around. Um, you're attracted to the stars, as people are. And what we've done here is I've just collected an image. And you can see in the very bottom left, this is one of our Flickr images has come up. So this is the image that we're going to engage with through the gameplay. So I've got my little guy now collecting the rest of the stars. Um, a little key has appeared there over on the right-hand side. And when you collect the key, as you can see, we've just had two options show up. And this is the point where we're going to start collecting information about this image. So if you're too far back and you can't read it, it says there's a high road and there's a low road. And at the bottom, there's a bit of instruction that's popped up. And it says, if the parchment contains a face, take the high road. Otherwise, take the low road. And this is the point where we're asking them to make a decision that will be recorded, and we will use that um, as metadata about the image in the collection. And in this particular case, we know the answer. So this is one of the images that we actually know is a face. So if they choose wrong, if they choose the low road, then game over. So this is the opportunity to punish them when they make a mistake, and we know there's a mistake. And this is how we keep them honest. If they take the high road, the idea is, I didn't develop this, but you get to go onto another screen, similar idea, and you keep doing this. Maybe you do it five times, and that constitutes a level. Um, and in, in the intermittent ones, I think what you would do is you would, sometimes you'd give them one you didn't know the answer, sometimes you'd give them one that you knew the answer. And again, this is about keeping the player honest, making sure they never know if you know the answer or not. And if you were going to do five levels, then the fifth one, you would want to make sure that in order to pass the level, you know the answer. You make sure that they do it properly. So these are some of the strategies that you can uh, incorporate to um, make sure that the metadata is as, as good as you might hope it to be. Um, and I didn't, I didn't follow up with this one because it takes a couple of minutes before you actually get useful information out of people. So there's not enough throughput of, of new data coming in. So it's one that I think might be able to work. You could polish up the graphics and make it a little more fun. Uh, but it wasn't pursued all the way. Instead, I decided to go with a different um, option for my game. And this is actually based on the dating app Tinder, which I'm sure none of you are aware of. Um, <laughs> basically, the idea here is you get an image. In Tinder, you get an image of somebody that Maybe you get to decide if you think they're nice looking or not. If you like them, you swipe one way. If you don't like them, you swipe the other. If you both decide you like each other, you get to exchange contact information and go out for coffee. And so I'm using the same idea of this swiping for um, classifying the images. And in this case, we've got you swipe left if the image has a face, and you swipe right if the image has no face. So I'll just show you this in practice. So we've got, it's the same image over and over and over again, because this is just a prototype. And what I did was I got one of my colleagues at work, um, a historian named Jennifer Evans, to test this out. And we were having a conversation. Um, 
about what she thought and she was giving me feedback. And we, we were talking for a couple minutes and I realized after a couple minutes that even though it was the same image, she was still classifying it. She was unwilling to let this image fall off the bottom of the screen. <laughs> and I thought, you know, we're onto a concept there that is addictive for the type of person growing up playing video games like myself. So I decided actually to uh, continue with this idea and so we've increased the quality of the graphics. I hope you'll, um, you'll believe we've got lava, which all good, games, all good games have lava. And in this case, we've started pulling in more images from the Flickr collection, so it's not the same image over and over again. And the way that we put in quality control here is we know the answer some of the times. So we've got some of them we know have faces, some of them we don't. In this case, if you're close enough, you can see this one does have a face. But unfortunately, it's part of the subset where I don't know that. So as you can see, the bear accepts that. So this is one of the problems that we currently have um, with this system. However, there are some where I do know the answer. And as I said, when you do know the answer and they do it wrong, then you have to punish the player. So in this case, we say wrong. And if you get too many wrong, it's, it's game over. So these, this is the ways that I've tried to engage with um, controlling what can be controlled and forgetting about the rest. Now, one of our participants in the game jam, Antonio Jesus uh, Sanchez Padial, has contributed a game along the same lines, which is, um, he's, he's really taken the 1980s graphics to heart here. So um, he's made it look like this on purpose, actually. And I think it's a good pairing with the, uh, the task that's involved, because it's a fairly simple task. It involves tagging, uh, rapid tagging, using four different tags. And, um, I'll just show you what that looks like. It's also got music here, so hopefully it's not too loud. Oops. So we got four tags. There's people, architecture, fauna, and portraits. And you choose which one depending on the image. If, if it doesn't match anything, you can zap it away and you get a new image coming in. Um, and here you've got a pink background. Sometimes there's a salmon-colored background. The idea is really um, he's done that to show me, as I'm demonstrating this, when he knew the answer. So on the pink ones, we know the answer. On the salmon ones, we don't. And so he's drawing on these same ideas, really, where we have to use the information we have. And then uh, if people get those ones right, then we get this idea that they're doing a pretty good job. And we can start to trust them a little bit more. So you're building up a profile of the player to decide if you're going to accept the data that they are uh, providing for you. I like the little fox, so I use it for the little logo that we've got down there in the bottom. So that was Antonio's approach to this um, challenge. The next one, actually, I think we're kind of coming into a much more gamified experience. This one feels like a Super Nintendo game. For those of you who um, played Super Nintendo in the 1990s, the quality of the graphics and the style of the gameplay really fits those 1990s style games. And just some background here. This is by uh, a man in Germany named Janusz Drews. And he has created, he's taken this idea where we've got an image collection, and he's created this virtual gallery where the images are on the walls of the gallery. And you are an art thief who is going in with instructions to steal a particular piece of art. And um, in, the, in the example I'm going to show you here, the job of the thief is to steal a piece of art that looks like a piece of music, which there are some of those in the collection. And in order to uh, validate that, he's also asked you to check that it falls between a certain creation date range, so between years X and Y. And there's some interesting ways that he's collecting data here. So I'll just show you how this um, looks. And you also have to avoid the robot guards as well. So here we are in the museum. We're walking around. There's one of the images. Nope, that's not music. Run away from the guards. And the interesting thing here, actually, I think, is the images, if you can't see them, the images on the screen uh, on the walls are just question marks until you go up to them. So you actually have to approach them to have a look. And we have instructions here to look for music. And what Janusz has done is he's decided that if I don't check the date, and you check the date by pushing one of the buttons. So if you don't check the date, he's assuming that you're saying that's not a piece of music. So he's tagging that as not music if you ignore, um, in this case, we've got a letter T. So he's actually collecting more data than I would have ever thought to do if I was designing this game. So I thought that was quite um, ingenious, actually. So we keep going, and we're trying not to uh, get caught by the guards. And I have to say, when I was playing this, um, my heart rate was going up. So it does give you that kind of sense of urgency that you're feeling like you want to do well. 
So we're scanning the image to check if it's the right date range. In this case, yes, it is. It satisfies our criteria. Our job is now to go back to the entrance. We'll watch out for robots. And we get to the exit, we leave, and we are rewarded with $2,647, and we're given a new challenge, a new piece of art to go in and look for. So, I mean, that is really a game as far as I'm concerned. It looks like a game, it plays like a game, it feels like a game, but we're collecting image uh, metadata at the same time. So um, really impressive work by both of those guys, actually, and I'm really quite grateful that they um, took on the challenge because they did a better job than I did, I think. So what I would suggest in terms of can we make these into games, what I would suggest we need to be thinking about is what makes games fun in the first place. Um, this isn't just about getting metadata. What we're giving to the players is a fun experience that they recognize as a game. So finding that addictive concept, look at what people are playing on the train and what is the actual activity they're doing and can you make that work for what it is you're trying to do. Um, draw on the genre as well. Lava is a great one. I think all good games have lava. Um, enemies, that ridiculous music that we heard from those games. Um, drawing on that genre puts people in the frame of mind that they're about to have some fun here. In terms of generating useful data and making sure that it's fun, even when we don't always know the answer, have they tagged this correctly, I think what you have to do is you have to punish minor um, if, if you're not sure, punish lightly, so you lose 10 points if we're not quite sure. Uh, you don't want to put people off by killing them when actually they've done it right and you just didn't know the answer. <laughs> but when you do know they've done something wrong, make sure you're punishing them um, reasonably severely because otherwise they won't get that feeling of playing a game. Uh, and in terms of life or death, so game over type decisions, make sure that you know that they have uh, screwed up. So if they get caught by the robots, for example, that's fine, they can understand why they've died. A couple of other things I think that you can draw upon is the notion of speed or time. So um, if you make people have uh, quick decisions, rapid fire decisions, uh, in the case of my game with the bears and the lava, you're making a decision every three seconds. If you don't make a decision, you lose that, that chance. So you can create a sense of urgency there. Um, and using the control subsets where we knew some of them were bicycles, we knew some of them were portraits, we can start to draw on uh, controlling what we can control, really. So I think my conclusions from this really is that I think we can make this um, into a more game-like experience that draws upon what we've learned from uh, the gaming industry over the past 30 or 40 years. And I think there are ways that we can get lots of accurate data out of that. So thank you very much to all of the people who participated, providing feedback, building games, writing code, uh, in the many ways that, that they um, helped out with this project. And if you are interested in this idea, I'm going to be around all day. I would love to hear from you. If you're interested in trying something like this or if you think you could offer something to it, um, please do come say hello. So thank you very much. Hi, you've very much presented from the idea of trying to make it as game-like an experience as possible. But with Wikidata, what we've sometimes found is almost the opposite end of the spectrum, that people who are already committed to the project like a game-like a game -like system of very fast yes-no decisions as a very efficient way to make contributions to something they already want to contribute to. So. For somebody that's already on board like that and so isn't necessarily going to play Angry Birds, I thought that your initial cut-down prototype of the swipe game that was incredibly fast, um, to some people that would be, without any of the, the bells and whi whistles and trappings, to some people that might be the most attractive game as the way they could make the, the fastest contribution to the project they want to contribute to, as well as as you pointed out, the, the speed um, element of it, which seems to be much quicker than your, than, than your later derivative of that. So a different, different spectrum, maybe.
different yeah. end of the spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, th I still think I would add lava into that, even if you're going to do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, the speed in the second one, I've slowed it down a little bit to make it a little bit easier to play. But you're right, absolutely. Um, there are people that don't need a gamified experience, and I think this is that's just a matter of interfaces. Something like this, I mean, I made that uh, first rendition in a couple of days. It was the first thing I'd ever done in terms of video game production. So the technological barriers come down a lot, and there are ways to experiment with um, new interfaces that don't necessarily have to have fuzzy bears and lava in them, but still allow people to, to do that type of task. And um, I would say, I mean, there are tons of people who love doing crowdsourcing acti activities. I think we could tap into a new market, though, by um, targeting people who wouldn't choose to do it if it wasn't uh, a game at the same time. So this is really about reaching out to another type of audience. But I appreciate what you're saying, and absolutely I agree that that speed element of that classification is quite powerful, I think. Um, in terms of like the efficacy of what you're doing in terms of actually getting data back, um, have you got any information about how effective it is in terms of tagging and what's the relationship to the size of control set you need? Because presumably you need that to be of a certain size to be able to kind of reward effectively. Well, I mean... I guess you have to wonder how long somebody's going to play. So if your control set is 20, then you can show them 20 images that, that they'll never see again. And if that's every three seconds, there's a minute of play there before you run out of control set. So I don't think you need a massive control set to, um, to be able to do that. And you might have multiple different control sets, for example. Uh, most people aren't going to play this for six hours. For, um, stop without stopping. So you you don't need a massive data set, I don't think. In terms of the, the the tags that are coming in, we haven't we haven't had people playing these yet because we were just trying to get the prototypes um, up and running for today. So we don't we don't actually know um, how much people are going to engage with it and and whether or not they are going to try to cheat us and and give us nasty false data. Or, or I mean, or just get stuff wrong, right? I mean, doing doing those taggings. It, is quite difficult in some cases. Especially when you have to do them quickly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Ben Osteen, who has been helping with the gameplay, has suggested that if you had a game that increasingly got faster and faster just to ramp up the difficulty, what you would find is eventually people would be uh, giving you effectively random information. Yeah. And what you need to do then is to start discounting their contributions once they reach that threshold. So that when you're processing your results data, if you keep a good log of information of difficulty level, what percentage accuracy you're getting, you can filter that out. It is an extra layer of work, though, you're right. Yeah, my question was about uh, what sort of things you can actually be asking the user uh, with the, the, the questions that you're sort of putting on the screen there. Um, it seemed to be find something that you're actually looking for. So, for example, find the piece of music. Um, presumably, that means ahead of time you have to decide that music is something you specifically want to try and find. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, uh, one of the other games where you had the four options, how do you decide what those four options are going to be? And was there anything that you couldn't um, discover using the, uh, these methods? I'm sure there are lots of things you can't discover, but in terms of adding a tag, I think the tags can be whatever the game maker is interested in, and I guess the game maker in this case is uh, either a scholar or a cultural heritage organization. I mean, I know James Baker, who used to work at the library, was working on some games, and he found that you could add subjective tags, so is this a pretty image, or is this an ugly or boring image, for example, and that's the type of thing people can engage with as well. Um, I imagine if you start asking for some very deep, complex uh, questions, and you're giving someone half a second to make the decision, you might find that you're not getting that type of information uh, in an accurate sense anyway. Is there something in particular you wanted to ask that you were wondering? Well, it's, it's just um, with a million images, uh, if you're only giving people four categories or something, um, it's going to be quite limiting in terms of you know, how do you categorize all of those if, if that was the objective or... Um, yeah. yeah, I don't think you'll ever exhaust the potential of yeah. categorizing with, with this type of an approach, but it does open up opportunities to get extra tags that we didn't have before, and also negative tags. I mean, I think we often don't put enough emphasis on negative tagging, so doesn't have a face, so that we don't have to go back and look at it again and say, well, did we, did we look at this one yet? Um, so there are opportunities. It, it's not to exhaust everything, but there are opportunities to add, I think, little bits. So it strikes me like all good video games, the next step is for this to go multiplayer. How are you going to deal with inter-annotator agreement? 
Yeah, uh, mul multiplayer, I mean, at the same time, I think that's very difficult. I've seen a couple of games try to do that where they pair you up with another player online, and of course the problem with that is there isn't another player waiting to play at the same time as you. Um, but at the moment, what we've done is all of our um, logging of the information is, is not live processed. Uh, but I think what ideally would be great is if you can start giving scores to tags, so 10 people, 100 people agree on this, or there's a lot of controversy, we're not so sure about this one. And that's the point where we'd need some live processing. Would you apply a death penalty to a lack of consensus? <laughs> yeah, I think I would, yeah. <laughs> Fair yeah, enough? Yeah, I have to agree, yeah. 